Welcome to the Victorious Living Podcast. You're about to hear real stories of real people who have discovered the real hope of Jesus Christ. I'm Christy Overton Johnson, the founder and publisher of Victorious Living Magazine. Since 2011, I've had the privilege of sharing the most amazing life stories. I never cease to be amazed at the life-transforming power of Jesus Christ. Today in our podcast, you're going to go deeper into these amazing God stories and hear from those who have overcome incredible odds and discover how they found a life of freedom. You can discover it too. I trust that you'll enjoy today's conversation between our host and our special guest. Thank you for listening and be sure to share the hope you hear and the mission of Victorious Living. Welcome back to the Victorious Living Podcast. I'm your host, Brooke, on the mic with Dale White. Dale, thank you so much for joining us today. Great to be with you. Thanks for having me. I absolutely am honored to have you on the show today. Um, For those of you listening, uh, Dale White's um, story was in the latest release of the Victorious Living magazine. Um, Your story was very, very impactful, and I'm sure a ton of people listening to this can relate to the story of they kept trying, they kept trying to find freedom um, from just any addiction or or anything that was bogging them down. And it felt like they kept failing and it felt like God was ignoring them and it felt like their attempts were in vain. And um, so I love how transparent you are in your story of um, your alcoholism and some of the relationships that were burned during that time in your life and, and losing your business. So you've definitely for lack of better words, have hit rock bottom in your life. Um, That is not your story now. There is so much redemption in your story and it doesn't matter how old you are and it doesn't matter what you've done. Redemption and grace and second chances are always on the other side when Jesus is in our life because that's the message of the cross, right? Is redemption and new beginnings. So Dale, why don't you share with us a quick recap of your story um, for those that may have not read it um, and don't really know too much about your testimony. Well, I think you hit on a big part of mine when you talked about the constant tries that I had. Um, basically, I for 40 years, I had a problem with alcohol and drugs and that dysfunction that that brought into my life. And it didn't matter what I tried. I, would, I couldn't seem to get free of that. Um, countless detoxes, five treatment centers, four DUIs. But I kept going down the rabbit hole. And even when I got out of prison, I ended up in prison um, because of my fourth DUI. Um, And even when I got out of prison, I did okay for a while. And and that was my scenario. I I would do okay for a while and then I'd fall again. And, um, you know, I I got to the very, the last time was October 10th, 2011. And that's when I, just got to the point where I didn't want to live anymore and I was afraid to die. Um, that was rock bottom for me. And I, I finally just surrendered my life to the Lord and, um, the rest is his story. Yeah. And what he, what he did for me. Um, but you know, there were a lot of, a lot of really difficult times in there. And, and a lot of times I really tried hard to change. Um, yeah. And I couldn't, I couldn't, um, you know, I thought the prison, so I got, I got my third DUI and I, I, I got sober after that one because the judge told me, he says, I'm giving you five years probation, but if you violate, I'm sending you to prison. So, and, and I did pretty good. I got, I got sober in AA. I was a little over three and a half years sober. And I met a, a woman in the rooms and I was in love and life was good. And, um, the only thing was neither one of us knew anything about loving each other. Um, and it was a really dysfunctional relationship. And yeah, I had about three years left to go before, I mean, three days left to go before my probation was over and she broke it off with me. And I went to my default mode. I went and got a six pack of beer, drank the six pack of beer. Wasn't enough. Got in my car and went to the store to get another six pack. And when I did, I rear into the cop and picked up my fourth DUI. All it took was three hours of drinking and, I ended up in prison. They gave me six and a half years for that. Um, And while I was in prison, she shot herself and killed herself. So it was really, you know, I don't think that was in my story. Um, I don't know how we ended up leaving that out, but um, that was, 
it was it was a really powerful yeah time. yeah and um, and dark time i mean so tell us a little bit about you know when when you talk about you know this girl that you liked you know she took her own life and you were depressed and sad because you guys broke it off and a lot of times actually I would say, I would argue to say every time we feel low as humans, it's because something relationally is going on, whether it's between us and another person or how we feel, you know, towards ourselves, or how we feel that God feels towards us. Um, so feelings are good indicators of something going on. Like they kind of alert us and indicate, but they make terrible leaders, Um, And so most of the time when we make decisions, you know, like getting drunk or getting behind a wheel and driving or taking our life or hurting somebody else, um, most of the time those those decisions are very emotionally charged by a very low emotion and or an anger. Um, And so you almost like can't in those moments, you don't know how to cope. So you you, you emotionally, you do things emotionally charged. So I would love to talk with you a little bit about specifically when you became a believer, but how important it is for a believer to, to love themselves. I understand, you know, as believers, you know, we're supposed to love God and love others. And and sometimes though that can be confused as a dutiful work that we neglect ourselves so much because we have a mission. And that's not, I don't believe what Jesus's intentions are is for us to negate how much we still need to be healed and to be whole and to, and to, to seek Jesus for our own personal identity. So tell us a little bit about your journey in loving yourself and who God created you to be. Absolutely. And, and, and I know most, uh, you know, I, I spend a lot of time in prisons now and, and I talk to a lot of people and and the same thing keeps coming back to me, um, our self-esteem and everything that the things that we think, feel about ourselves are all so important in how we deal with life. Yeah. life and most of the time for me, I was walking around carrying so much shame and so much guilt um, that I couldn't forgive myself. All right. I was really easy to forgive other people, but I couldn't, I couldn't get to the point where I could forgive myself. I was just, I was always hanging my head when I was, I never felt equal to anybody else. I always felt less than because of all the things that I had done while I was using and, and, and not doing what I'm supposed to do. So celebrate recovery was a big tool for me because it helped me um, get in touch with a lot of that stuff. But I had a mentor, um, who didn't really have an addiction problem. He was my sponsor, but he didn't have, he he didn't have any alcohol or drug problems. He had other issues. But um, the one thing, the reason I asked him is because I saw his faith in action and his walk and I wanted what he had. And he was able to, it took some time, a, a few years of us meeting every Sunday morning for an hour and me listening to him and him listening to me but he was he was able to you know i th- i think i i need to really back up because until i was the age 14 i had a real strong faith and a real strong belief um i was raised that way um my parents divorced when i was 14 though and um i i would stay curled up in a ball in my room and play this 45 record of the lord's prayer asking god to fix it mm-hmm. and when he didn't I walked away from God. I don't realize, I didn't realize it at the time. That's what I was doing, but that's what I did. I ran from God for 40 years and then I didn't know how to let him in. And, you know, um, that's what I had to do. And I had to really seek him in everything. Mm -hmm. Um, the other part about that is because now it doesn't matter what I'm going through. He's always there for me. Right. And that's what, that's the point I have to stress to everybody without that relationship with him, I've got nothing because that's what I have to stand on every single day. And I know that stuff is going to get come my way. That's going to be hard for me to deal with. And, and I need to make sure that I have that relationship with him and that that relationship is good and it's strong and I take care of it. Yeah. Tend to it. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's interesting. And 
we all do this. Like, it doesn't matter if you've been convicted of a crime or not. If you are living on this earth and you're a human, we all do this. But I find it interesting that we, when things are going bad, we automatically think it's God's fault. Even a divorce, even things that like have nothing to do with like a certain decision we've made, right? We're like, come on, God, you could have saved them. Come on, God, you could have done this. And I find it so interesting because I think we, because God's so big, we think that God's this puppeteer up there. And yes, he is sovereign and he can do all things and he can save people and he can, you know, change the course of history. And he did with the cross. But when it comes to things that we've been petitioning for or wanting, like in your case, you wanted the Lord to bring your family back together. Right. So it's like, well, he, why isn't he doing it? And then you're upset and then it just grows. And I, I think everybody listening to this right now can probably pinpoint to a situation of a time that you thought God was going to do something and he didn't. So then you characterized him by being distant, angry, and selfish, which are none of those are listed as the fruit of the spirit. So if, if he has the spirit of God, none of those are listed as those fruits, as the, you know, of the fruit of the spirit. We all do it. And so when it comes to situations like that, when God didn't answer something, you know, the way we wanted to, well, God's holy. So God cannot sin against you. So it's important for us to go, okay, God, you are answering this in the way that I wanted you to help me, help me course correct, help me adapt. Please put other things in my life that remind me of your goodness when I'm tempted to believe that you don't care about the situation because just because he didn't do it in the way you thought he was going to do it um, doesn't mean he's not there and, and, and paying attention to it. And, you know, he did say we go through hard things in this, in this life, but I think it's so beautiful that God has been so patient with you throughout your story and that he has given you so many second chances. And then he's helped you mentally view him better. And I think it's important not only to view God in the appropriate manner, but to view yourself the way God views you in an appropriate manner. So, you know, scripture says that we are co-heirs with Christ. Like once you've accepted him as your savior, like you are now a co-heir with him, which he's seated at the right hand of God. It also says we are the righteousness of God so we can stand boldly before him on judgment day. Most of the time, believers still describe themselves or define themselves as a worthless sinner that barely made it by, but by the grace of God, but that's not the narrative. Even God writes of us as believers. He calls us sons and daughters of God. He says, I no longer call you a slave or a slave because a slave doesn't know what a master is doing, but I call you friend in John 15. So I think it's super important for all of us believers to know how God views us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So we acknowledge the fact that we are far from God and we are sinners, but he also says that we've been adopted into his family and have the right to be called children of God. And when you know who you are, you want to, you want to level up. You want to do things, not because, because your dad said he had to, and this is the rule now it's no, I have a new identity, so I can't help but want to do what God's put on my heart. So I love that your story, even though it's been a longer one and there's been moments where you've been like, God, where are you at? Like, come on, like, if you can change this, let's do it. Let's do this together. And in God's long suffering and patience towards you, it's been, it's been a different journey. So let's fast forward a little bit into your life. Now you're saved. You're, you're working alongside, um, you know, fellow prisoners and you're loving on people and you're, you're bringing the message of Christ. But do you still struggle with wanting to go back to your old life or do you feel completely set free by the grace of God that that I, I feel set free? And I, I, I do want to, you know, the one thing that I really realized that made a big difference in my life is that God gives all of us free will. Right. He is not going to dictate to us what we have to do. Right. That's his, his gift to us is free will. How we use that affects not only us, but other people. So when my parents decided to divorce, that was their free will. Yeah. But it ran over into my life. Right. All right. 
But what God does is he uses all things for good. All right. He, or he can use all things for good. So in essence, all of that that happened meant that I still had to go through at least the pain of the divorce and everything yeah. else. My yeah. Choices, my choices during that, if I would have, if I would have stayed plugged in with the Lord probably would have been different than if I had gone with the peer pressure when I was 14 of my friends who were starting to smoke weed and do drugs and, and that kind of thing. I, I just, that was, I went to default mode where I didn't have to feel anything when it was that, that was happening. But now it's, it's totally different now because I, I do have him and I do walk with him. Yeah. Um, I don't think about using and drinking anymore. Um, and, and my phone rings a lot. Matter of fact, it rang up right before we got on here with a, a boss I used to have whose daughter just committed suicide. And he's asked me to pray for him right before I came on the show um, with you. And, and that happens a lot because I do wear my recovery and, and my life with the Lord on, on my shoulders now. Yeah, and I love that. You know, I, I have the privilege and the honor of being able to spend most of my days in and out of prisons, talking to other, other men and women who have that same struggle. Yeah. I love that so much. Tell us a little bit about, um, recovery groups, um, you know, different ones, whether it's AA celebrate recovery, um, whether it's been different church groups, if you could talk to anybody on the board of any of these groups, they could be well-known groups or not. What is one thing that you would maybe admonish them for doing in a good way? Like, Hey, this is really helpful for somebody sitting in a seat that's trying to recover outside of obviously giving your life to Christ. But what are some like some practical methods that you have learned that you think would be helpful for people listening? Well, first of all, I want to say that most people don't understand or really know where 12 step recovery groups got their start. Right. Um, it was actually one man who was Bill Wilson with Alcoholics Anonymous who had a struggle to stay sober and he couldn't do it. But he realized that his, his connection with God and his faith was the, the the thing that he was missing. Yeah. So he looked for a lot of different ways to open the door wider for other people to come in so that he could use the the, the small mustard seed, the, the plant plant that seed in them so that they could also have that spiritual experience that he had had where he met the Lord. So all 12-step groups are really designed to help you build a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what, that's the whole idea of the way they got started. Yeah. They don't, none of them, the most of them nowadays don't have a specific belief in Jesus Christ or, yeah. you know, they, they're, they, they allow, and, and Bill Wilson started that. He said, you know, came to believe in a power greater than myself that of my understanding, because he was trying to get the door open so that they could grasp everybody yeah. needs the power greater than themselves. And we know us true believers know that it's Jesus Christ. So, right, right. You know, I, I say keep an open mind. Yeah. You know, and and those of you that are so set in your ways in those groups, um, your opinions sometimes are hurtful um, to people that are really trying to trying to just keep keep one day at a time in in front of them so that they can make it through. You know. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's. It's so important, right, of basically doing your homework in a sense of, you know, you're in these groups maybe once a week or how, I don't know how often they are. And it's like, but you still have things you need to do on your own and like, you know, take from those sessions. So like I know from like my own counseling sessions, like if she said, hey, I think it would benefit you to do this like in your, on your Saturdays or whatever it is. Well, it's like, okay, then I'm going, I need to heed that and still do that. Like just me showing up once a week. I mean, barring God, but like you still have other, you know, responsibilities to do, to be able to seek healing. And so I think that's awesome that that's kind of your piece of advice is like, be open-minded. Like there, there's somebody on the outside looking in that's maybe been in your shoes before going, Hey, this will be helpful to you. Oh, like the, going to church. The biggest will thing that the biggest thing that helped me, though, is my mentor, my sponsor, who's still my mentor and sponsor today. He has been. I talked to him yesterday on the phone. Even he lives in Tallahassee and I live in Gainesville. Yeah. But Go Gators. The one thing he yeah. <laughs> me was 
spend the first part of your day before you start your day with the Lord and yeah. do a devotional, pray. Don't start your day without doing that. And I, he says, how are you going to discipline yourself to do that? Because he was right. When I came around, I didn't have any discipline. And the last thing I would think of doing was picking up my Bible in the morning and reading it. Yeah. Um, so I got in the habit of whatever verse that I studied that morning, I wouldn't start my day until I posted it on Facebook. It was a discipline for me. It wasn't meant for the people on Facebook. Yeah. It was how I held accountability to myself. I wouldn't start my day until I'd after done my devotional. And then the last thing before I, I went to start my day is I'd, I would just post a verse, no comments to it or anything else, and, and just post that. But, you know, it's been almost 12 years now, and I haven't missed a day. Wow. And I really believe that that has made a big difference in my life because I do start my day with the Lord. And I, I, I turn to him when, when you start the day with the Lord, you realize throughout the day that you need him a lot more than, than you yeah. thought. And there's a lot of more times that you turn to him through the day um, in order to, he's with me all the time. All the time. Yeah. He does. will never leave you. Without nor ceasing is my way, but that's my way of walking with him. I mean, yep. you know. Yeah. I love that. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but this was very interesting to me. Someone was telling me about decision fatigue. So the later in the day it becomes, the worse your decisions can get, right? Most people get drunk and do very mysterious things that night. Uh, but it's the same thing on a smaller scale, um, but a scale nonetheless with eating. You know, if you you don't wake up, I mean, most people don't wake up every morning eating Oreos for breakfast. Oreos are normally a decision you make later in the day when you're tired of making decisions. I mean, you make thousands of decisions a day between what shoes you're going to wear, where you're going to go, what you're going to, you know, all the different things, all the decisions that you make. And like, there's something to be said of like decision fatigue. And so, you know, I'm not saying that people can't do their quiet time at night. That's not what I'm saying here. So if you're, if you're hearing that, that's not what I'm saying, but I do find it to be super beneficial and helpful to that, for that to be the first thing you decide to do because all your other decisions will flow from it. And it's not in the sense of like, you're going, okay, God, what color shirt should I wear today? It's not like, as cognitive as that it's more of like i'm like reorienting reorienting my heart in the morning you know and it, it looks different for everyone it could be one verse it could be three chapters of the bible you know that you spend time going hey lord like thank you i want to thank you first and foremost for loving me purchasing me and wanting a relationship with me, not because you're mad and disappointed in me, but because I'm the apple of your eye and I was the joy set before you on the cross. So thank yeah. you, like reorienting who you are in him and learning about him. I mean, scripture is 70% narrative. It's about, I think about 20% poetry and 10% yeah. theology. So when you're reading these narratives in scripture, it's not, okay, God, how can I become more like David? How can I become more like Ruth? These are, these are people just like you and me that had an encounter with Yahweh, with the Messiah, who wants an encounter with you. And the ones he used the most powerfully, like David and yeah. Paul and all the rest of them, were also the biggest sinners. Yes. They or, were I don't, know, I don't know if you can describe no, a sinner. I know what you're saying. Small, yes. All sin, he sees all sinners. He sees same. it all. But, but yeah. And, and but so. I mean, no. Yeah, I'm with you where it's like I, you know, faith is a gift from God as well. You know, he scripture says he's the author and perfecter of our faith. Like he starts it and he finishes it. So faith doesn't even come from us. Thank God our faith is not in our faith. If I had faith in my faith, I'd be all over the place. But I have faith in the one who gave me everything. Well, one and, of my prayers early on was, Lord, I believe, help me with my unbelief. Right. I saw that 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 scripture but yep. that was true for me i do believe but there was a lot of days where i was just on shaky ground right help uh, me, uh, help, help my unbelief you know yeah. help convince me that you really are real exactly i mean it's the same thing with repentance i mean paul is emphatic about it he's almost like silly kids don't you know that it's his loving kindness that leads us to repentance so sometimes i have to ask for loving kindness 
because even my 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 changing of my behavior the word repentance of metanoia it's that word used in greek of like cha- your your mind is being changed so even that is something i can't muster up in myself well like, i know things i want to do but i don't do them right 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 so it's, that, it's, that, that was another one of paul's yep and I think it's just so awesome how how kind the Lord is. I think a lot of us need to be reminded of that. I think, you know, we need to be reminded that it's, you know, we were we are his joy. Like we are the apple of his eye. We are his kids. Um, for those of you who have given your life to Christ, you know, you have the right to be called sons and daughters. And for those of you who haven't, he's welcoming you in. I mean, I think of the movie Annie, right? So Annie's this orphan and, you know, daddy Warbucks comes in and and takes her into this lavish life. And she wants all her other orphan friends to come. She's like, come on, like, come with me. Right. It's, it's like, I've been adopted into this and I want you to be in this as well. And I, I mean, I can't imagine adopting a kid and then my kid 10 years down the road introduces herself as an orphan. My heart would be broken. I'd be like, no, you're my daughter. I purchased you. Like, you are mine. Like, don't introduce yourself as an orphan. You can call yourself a daughter of Brooke. And that's the same thing as a believer when you, you've been bought with a price. And so you don't have to walk around like an orphan anymore. You don't have to walk around down in the dumps. You can walk around with life and life abundantly. It doesn't mean life is perfect, but our circumstances and our, and our emotions cannot be the leader, you know, of our decisions and thank God for his grace, because even when they are our, our captain, you know, he comes right in as a good shepherd and brings us back to where he ultimately had us. Absolutely. And it's so beautiful. And Dale, your story just screams of that. And I know those that are listening if you guys think that, oh, that could only happen for Dale or that could only happen for whoever else has been on the podcast, that is a lie. It can happen for you and it and it has happened for you. Christ did die for you and he has a plan. And so try not to put a timeline on God's plan of like, well, I've been saved for 10 days now. Why am I not out of here? You know, try to, you know, God is a good shepherd. He's very patient. He's very kind and he's working on things that you can't see yet. And so like Dale, like you said, that prayer that's in, um, I believe it's in the book of Mark of, of, you know, help me in my unbelief, you know, yeah. that is the prayer that we all can pray is we all have doubts and we all have things that are hard for us to believe. I mean, God is so much bigger than even what we could capture. Right. Even, even in, the holes in your hands, you know, yes, I mean, yes. I, I, I get it. Like, and God's like, yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, Jesus still showed him, but he's like, blessed are those who believe and don't see, I mean, so yeah. he knows how to meet people who need to see it. Yeah. And he knows how to, you know, meet people who are just like, okay, God, you, you are who you say you are. Um, and nobody's story is the same. And so that is the beauty of who our God is before I end each show with victorious living podcast. I'd like to ask each guest what their favorite, one of their favorites. I know there's so many, one of their favorite qualities about God. So what is a quality or characteristic that you love most about the Lord? That he never changes. Um, You know, once you get to know him, you know, you get to learn more about his qualities and you realize that he does not change, that his word is the truth. And it's something you can count on every single minute. Yeah. And, you know, the love that he has for us is so deep and so wide that we can't even fathom what that is. And that brings so much hope because this is just a little little piece of time that we're spending here in this life, in this this earth. Eternity is a, I mean, we can't even imagine what that is. Right. So um, knowing that I'll be with him forever and the and the wonderful loving father that he is um it just it doesn't matter what happens i i know that there's going to be trouble all right we're we're guaranteed that but we have him and he yep. will walk with us 
and we will be better and, and, and maybe maybe we can help some other people because of it. 100%. We can empathize with others. And, you know, in the Old Testament, when Josh was like with the stones of remembrance, like remember, like it's so important to call to remembrance the times God's pulled through for you. So instead of oh, I'm so fearful of what's going to come and what's going to happen, it's, oh, I've seen God deliver me from this. I've seen God do this for me and for somebody else. You know, we will overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Our testimony is times that God's pulled through for us and he always will and he never changes. So Dale, thank you so much for joining the Victorious Living podcast and sharing your story. It's been an absolute joy. It's been a joy for me too. And thank you all so much for doing what you do um, and for touching as many as you all do. Yeah, Uh, absolutely. Amazing work you all do. Yeah, thank you so much. It's an honor to be a part of the Victorious Living magazine. So thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Victorious Living Podcast. Did you know that you can help incarcerated men and women experience Victorious Living? Visit victoriouslivingmagazine.com to find out more information. Are you an inmate in prison who needs encouragement? Write to us at Victorious Living, P.O. Box 2751, Greenville, North Carolina, 27836. Every inmate who writes to us from prison receives personal correspondence from our team, quarterly devotions, as well as their own quarterly subscription to Victorious Living Magazine.